Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. So teaching on times and seasons and what that means and why Paul said it was not necessary for him to write about it to the church. Um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't study out what the meaning of times and seasons. Just because Paul didn't write about it doesn't mean there's not some information to be gleaned regarding the phrase times and seasons. So because Paul didn't write about it, we do have to go back into the Old Testament to look up the meaning. The reason why Paul did not write about it, however, is because the times and seasons have more to do with the second advent than it does the rapture of the church. So Paul gives us the rapture of the church at Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Thessalonians chapter 5, technically, there's a gap of seven years there. Because what you find out is verse number 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That's the second advent. So what happens is, you have the rapture of the church, Thessalonians 4, 13-18. You have a seven-year gap of Daniel's 70th week. And now you have the second advent, day of the Lord, peace and safety. Then destruction comes upon you as a woman in travail, so forth and so on. So there are gaps in your Bible, as I taught in Genesis about there being gaps. Well, here's a good case scenario where there's a gap between chapter 4 and chapter 5 of seven years. And the reason why you know the time period of Thessalonians 5 being... The end of the Daniel 70th week and not the beginning is because times and seasons is God removing a king and setting a king up. Mm. And what God's going to do, the times and the seasons, as it relates to Daniel 70th week, is God's going to remove the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the devil, remove him and his kingdom, and establish mm. himself as king over the world. And that's why it says, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. That's them in the last half of the, of the Great Tribulation, the last half uh, called the Great Tribulation of Daniel's 70th week. The world is under a false sense of security, under the beast system there. And in the midst of all of that, the Lord is going to show up in the second advent and obviously bring destruction upon the world and then bring in the Millennial Kingdom. Go to uh, Daniel chapter 2. And so what we saw is that phrase, times and seasons... Is only found three times in the Bible. We just saw it there in Thessalonians 5. Its first appearance is in Daniel chapter 2. In relation to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel chapter 2. And verse number 21. Daniel 2, 21. And he changeth the times... And the seasons. So what does times and seasons mean? Well, then he says, He removeth kings and setteth up kings. So the times and seasons is connected to, just like change in weather, it's connected to change in kings and kingdoms. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He's fixing a, uh, well, he already destroyed Jerusalem, but he's fixing to do it again in 600 B.C., and then he's going to do it again in 586 B.C. That's the third and final time that all of Israel is going to be under the captivity of Babylon for 70 years. At the end of the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar comes off the throne. God removes him. And you get the Medians and the Persians that take Babylon's place. Darius and Cyrus and all that, they take the place of Babylon. After the Medes and the Persians, then it's Alexander the Great who conquers the world at the age of, I think, 30 years old. Yeah. After him is uh, the Roman Empire. And then after them is going to be the Antichrist Empire. And so you find this down in uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where it says the head, verse 32, the image, the image's head was fine gold. That's Babylon. His breast and his arms of silver. That's going to be Media Persia. His belly and his thighs brass. Uh, that's going to be uh, uh, Alexander the Great. 
Greece, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part uh, clay. Uh, his legs of iron is the Roman Empire, his feet part iron, part clay. That's the empire, that's the kingdom of the Antichrist. And he says, uh, Thou sawest until a stone, that's Christ's kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Thou sawest, second advent, thou sawest till, till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet. So that's the Antichrist kingdom, second advent, uh, that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to, piece, to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away. That sounds like Psalm chapter 1. Amen. The chaff, the wind driveth it away. You read uh, Paul, uh, John the Baptist's preaching. And he says about the, uh, uh, the threshing floor there. And the chaff. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Uh, that's a picture of the second advent. The Lord comes to burn up the chaff that's been given the wheat Amen. a hard time. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so we were removed seven years prior. And the wheat that remains, that the chaff is giving a fit, is the nation of Israel, those that won't bow to the pressure of the son of perdition, the Antichrist, in the last three and a half years. So that stone being cut without hands, that's the rock. Not Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> this is the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes out of heaven like a stone, and he smites the feet of the image, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And that image there represents all the kingdoms of the world for the past 2,600 years. And the last one being the Antichrist kingdom. And they all come crashing down together. What you have in the future is Mystery Babylon. Mother of harlots, abomination of all the earth. That's Revelation 17. That's the feat. It started or stemmed from literal physical Babylon, what was the head of gold, see? So where God's full circle, where it began, Babylon, it ends that way, mystery Babylon. That's the second advent. Now, I think I showed you that the reason why God gave the nation of Israel to the world, and the reason why God gave the land to the nation of Israel, was that that land there and the nation of Israel, Abraham's seed, uh, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes that come out of that, were to be a light unto the Gentiles. So that way, that region, that nation there, that land, was supposed to be the land where all truth would stem from and go out to all the world. And you get a picture of that when David took the throne, he conquered all of his enemies, but God would not allow him to build a temple because he was a bloody man. So he says, your son Solomon is going to build that temple. Solomon builds the temple, Solomon builds the kingdom there, and the whole world had peace and safety. And the world had an abundance of blessings upon it. Why? Because the nation of Israel was a light to all the Gentiles, to all the world. All good flowed out of the throne of Solomon. In the millennium, there's going to be a throne there, and the water of life is going to leave the throne. And everywhere that water of life goes and touches, it brings it back to life. And when Christ sits on the throne, he is the light of the world. To all the outcasts, to all the dispersed, okay? Now, the way this thing gets mixed, mixed up or messed up in the church age, somebody always wants to be the, the, the head, right? Somebody always wants to be in charge. So, a religion had to come on the scene that would replace Israel and say, from us flows all of God's goodness. But you got to come and kiss the ring to get it. <laughs> and that's the Roman Catholic Church. Of the toe. The Roman Catholic Church believes they are mm -hmm. literal, I don't want to say physical, but literal spiritual Israel, the kingdom of God, present on earth in the kingdom of heaven. And that all truth and all blessing and all light flows from the Vatican and into all the world. They stole something that was given to the nation of Israel, and as mystery Babylon, they have applied it to themselves. So what do you have? You have all nations and all kingdoms and kings and queens 
coming and bowing and presidential leaders, God forbid, and senators and governors all bowing at the feet of Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. See that? Yeah. That sets up the way for the Antichrist when he comes in. It'll be the same exact thing, only it'll be uh, horrific as it plays out. And that's because we are in the church age. We're not in ethnic Israel. Right. We're not under the law. And we're not in the millennial kingdom. We are in the church age, right? So there has to be a source of light. There has to be a source from which God is going to pour out his blessing. It ain't going to come from the Vatican and Rome. It ain't going to come from a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem until God rebuilds it there. How's it going to come? It's going to come to the body of Christ. It's going to come to the church. We right now are representatives. We are in God's stead to be a light to the world. The, go to uh, 1 Peter real quick. Let me show you 1 Peter. Right now we are in a spiritual period of time that illustrates or pictures the way things were and the th way things will be. When they crucified Christ and did not want him to be their Messiah, God turned to the Gentiles. And in a weird way, the Gentiles now become the light to the rest of the world. Ain't that weird? Light was supposed to come from Israel. Israel rejected God. So now, the light comes in through the Gentiles into all the world. And America is being the greatest propagation of truth throughout the world. Okay? And that's because we are a spiritual nation. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse 9. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, notice that, a peculiar people, that ye should what? Show forth, put out, the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. So in the past, it was the nation of Israel, that land, that region, that place, that kingdom that was to be a light to all the world. Solomon blew it. Many kings came, many kings went, until the nation of Israel went full-blown into captivity in 600 B.C. under Nebuchadnezzar. Then the Gentiles are in charge of the world from 600 B.C. until the end of Daniel's 70th week when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. All that time is going to be run by the Gentile world. Within that, God instituted a plan and a purpose to bring in a spiritual nation, the body of Christ, the church. That's what we are, the body of Christ. We are the church. And we are to be the light for the rest of the world. Amen? And that's because we are a spiritual holy nation. But we are not a literal, physical, bodily nation of, of, of uh, religious militants trying to convert people by forcing them into a conversion. We don't do things that way. We give the truth, and what you do with the truth, to believe it or reject it, well, that's up to you. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church has always tried to make people come to the light at the end of a spear or a gun or a machete or a guillotine, they force your conversion. Well, that's not how God set the thing up. Nor does the church replace Israel. We are simply placeholders. <laughs> We are gap fillers. We are holding down the fort until Jesus Christ comes and he's able to then bring in the millennial kingdom to where he will once again be in Jerusalem ruling and reigning through the nation of Israel to be a light to all the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to get this idea, well, because Israel rejected God, that somehow now the church gets all the blessings that belong to Israel. That's not your case. Nope. You don't get what God promised to Israel. You get what God promised to the church. And that's different than what God promised to Israel. See? Um, because Israel's still going to get their land. Look at uh, Acts chapter 1. Remember, times and seasons is the setting up and the removing of. And God has been doing that for quite some time now since Israel went into captivity. <coughs> Uh, Acts chapter 1. 
and look at verse 6. This is after Christ's resurrection, but before his ascension into heaven. Verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time, watch it, restore again? Why again? Because they lost it. They lost it in 600 B.C. Around, you know, it was 606, then 600, then 586. But they lost it around 600 B.C. And Israel never was a kingdom since that time. They were always under somebody else's rule. Even if they had their land and rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah, they were still under Xerxes and Artaxerxes and all those guys. And they were under the Caesars and... They never, and now they're under whatever we, the United Nations, allows them to have. Israel's not a free nation. No. Israel doesn't have the, the land that belongs to God. They don't believe it belongs to Israel, it belongs to God. You find that when you read Isaiah. My land, he calls it. They don't have their land. Their land is controlled by what the United Nations says they're allowed to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not allowed to fight their own wars without the United Nations saying, how they can fight, where they can fight, when they can fight, and America putting pressure on America not to fight this certain way and not to do this, or we'll pull support from you and all that kind of stuff. America, Israel don't have their land yet. Now watch. They're like, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he, Jesus, said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. I'm talking about God doing secret things. They ask God a straight up question. Are you going to do this thing now or not? And he just says, it ain't for you to know. It's none of your business. Yeah. Not on the need to know. Yeah, you don't need to know. Ain't that a wild thing? The last thing that God's really telling the early church there is, you don't need to know what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave you in the dark. And for the next two, next 2,000 years, what? The Israel's been saying, will you at this time restore the kingdom? What are they looking for? They're looking for their kingdom to come. How are they looking for it? Through a Messiah to come. So what are they going to do? They're going to take the first man that looks like a Messiah type figure and allow him to be their Messiah. Yep. Only it's not going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the white horse rider, Revelation 6, who then becomes the red horse rider and the black horse rider and the pale horse rider. And now you've got one seal, two seal, three seal, four seal, five seal. Before you know it, the sixth seal opens, and that's the second advent. So he says, they say to him, will you at this time restore the kingdom? His reply to how... He's going to define the restoring of the kingdom is what? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. So when Paul writes, uh, writes there, it's no, there's no need for me to write unto you about the times and the seasons. What's he writing about? The restoration of the kingdom of Israel. That's what he's writing about. He does not need for and You don't need to know, which is what Jesus Christ also said. You don't need to know about the times or seasons. You don't need to know when I am going to bring the kingdom back to Israel. Church don't need to know it. As far as give me the date, give me the time. Why? Because we're not looking for that. We're looking for the rapture. Yeah. 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 Seven years prior to times and seasons taking place, the removal of the Antichrist and the setting up of Jesus Christ, seven years prior to that is the rapture of the church. That's Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul did write 13 through 18, wherefore comfort one another by these words, what words? Words concerning the rapture. He said, it's good for you to know about the rapture, the blessed hope. But when Israel's going to get their kingdom, not, you don't need to know about that. Why? Well, because when it happens, you'll be riding back with Christ when it happens. If you are Israel on the earth getting your kingdom, that means you missed out on the body of Christ's rapture. So unless you plan on being on the receiving end, you don't need to know about the date that's going to happen. That's what he's trying to teach you there. Um, go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. The disciples are ready for it to change back from Gentile kingdom to Jewish kingdom. But Christ said it's not, you don't need to know. 
They didn't need to know the times or the seasons because the beginning of the church age was just, was just started when Jesus Christ said that. Acts chapter 3 and look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Watch it. When the times, there's that times and seasons, when the times of refreshing shall come, from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So you have two things mentioned, the times of refreshings and the times of restitution. What is that? That's the millennial kingdom. When Jesus Christ, when the presence of Jesus Christ is on the throne in Jerusalem, you know what they're going to get? They're going to get their kingdom back. You know what they're going to get? Their land back. You know what the land's going to get? It's going to get refreshed. It's going to get restored. Because for the last seven years, you've had earthquake, fire, hail, uh, uh, so stars darken, sun darken, moon darken, the water being turned to blood, a third of all the green grass burned up, a third of all the trees burned up. You've got corpses everywhere. The Bible says that. He says, come ye, uh, fowls of the air, come ye birds, come and eat. Come and eat. Come and eat what? All the carcasses. Of who? All the mean men, the proud men, the mighty men, the kings of the earth, the princes of the earth, the kingdoms of the Gentiles are all going to be destroyed and there's going to be a bloodbath and there's going to be a bunch of hungry birds flying around in the air. They haven't eaten either. It's a famine for the birds because no grass, no trees. Everything is just burnt up. There's nothing for them to eat. All they can do is pick off the bodies of a bunch of dead corpses. So Jesus Christ is like, come on in for supper, birds. Let's go. You know what they... Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Just for you, Mike. Hmm. Like, I wish you would have used that whiteboard. <laughs> so, all your post trib pre wrath guys that believe you've got to go through 5.25 years of tribulation, and then you go, then the church is raptured, they say three quarters of the way in. They mean 5.25 years, whatever the month is on that. So what you have is you have Daniel's 70th week. That's Daniel chapter 9, 26 and 27. Okay, what you have is as soon as the church is raptured up here, okay, that's our rapture. I got this guy on our YouTube page. He keeps saying um, Baptists are the Antichrist and the church raptures is heresy. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> so I know Daddy's going to watch this and comment on it. Um, so at the rapture of the church, you have your first seal, which is Revelation chapter 6. That's the white horse rider holding a rainbow in his hand. All right? And the. Now, it's Daniel's 70th weeks is seven years. It's, it's 70 weeks of seven years. 70 times seven, so 490. It's a total of 490 prophetical years. We've already had 483. The clock stopped when Christ died. We've already had 483. So seven years to that gives you your 490 years. So, if you only have seven years of time after the church age rapture, split it in half, you get 3.5 on one side, and you get 3.5 on the other. Now, your post-trib pre-wrath guys, so post-trib, they believe a rapture happens at the end of the uh, all seven years. Mm -hmm. Your post-trib pre and that's a whole lot easier to disprove, the the harder one to deal with is because they're they're so militant but they're brain dead 
is uh, this is this business here post trib pre wrath? What they mean by post trib is they say tribulation is only for 5.25 years. The last 1.75 years is wrath. So post trib, post 5.25 years, post trib, pre wrath. And of course, I showed you that all seven years is called the wrath of God, not just a little bit slice here. So what they teach is in Thessalonians chapter 4, they teach that that is a rapture of the church here. They teach Thessalonians chapter 4 is a rapture of the church here. That's what they teach. And they teach Thessalonians chapter 5 being a continuation of chapter 4. And the day of the Lord in chapter 5 is the same thing as the rapture of the church in Thessalonians 4. In other words... They say the day of the Lord is the rapture of the church. That's what they teach Thessalonians chapter 5. Is What I'm trying to show you is that Thessalonians chapter 5, you have to know the context of that time period there, which is the entirety of Daniel's 70th week. You have to know about that by reading, what does he say? Of times and seasons, you have no need that I write unto you. If times and seasons were important for the church... If this period, if we were going to go through any portion of Daniel's 70th week, shouldn't it be important for Paul to write to us about it? Yeah. Yeah. But he says, of the times and seasons, you have no need that I write unto you. For you know perfectly well the day of the Lord so come as a thief of the night. So the day of the Lord has something to do with times and seasons, but they say the day of the Lord has something to do with the rapture. The day of the Lord has nothing to do with our rapture. That's the day of Christ. Amen. The day of the Lord has everything to do with all seven years of tribulation. But in the context of Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord is talking about when he comes back at the end. Right. Not when we go up, but when he comes back. Yeah. Because when he comes back, it's times and seasons. What is times and seasons? It's the removal of something and the setting up of something else. Yeah. That's what times and seasons are. So that's what you're getting when you're getting these. I'll show you Matthew 24. Look at verse, look at verse 28. Let's see if you're smarter than a fifth grader. Matthew 24. Look at verse 28. He says, I'm sorry, verse. Um, yeah, 28. That's right. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Yeah. You know what they teach there? Now, what, what, when you read that verse, what, what are you thinking of? All right, somebody's, there's some birds eating. Yeah. Okay. If I take you over to Revelation 19, what you find there is at the Battle of Armageddon, there's a bunch of birds flying around, cleaning up the mess. Thank you, brother. Yeah. You know what they teach? Pills, trip, pre wrath guys teach? For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the church be gathered together. Oh. Uh -uh. Well, because they teach Isaiah 40, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. Oh, my word. <laughs> so they make the rapture of the church, Matthew 24, 28. That's the rapture of the church. And with the rapture of the church, immediately they say, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun, shall the sun be darkened. So what they say is, as soon as the tribulation of those days is over, then we're caught up to heaven as eagles. Oh, come on. That's what they teach. Wow. That's really <laughs> yeah. This is what you're up against in the last days. This is the kind of doctrine they have running around. Okay? That's what I want to show you there. Now, in Acts 3, in Acts 3, he has something there. He talks about the times of restitution and... Um, it was times of restitution and times of refreshing. Yeah. Restitution and refreshing. Yeah. Now that has to do with times and seasons. You know that we're fixing to go into a time of refreshing. Yeah. We're fixing to go in. That's a change in season. Yeah. Restitution, that's the things being restored back to its natural uh, environment. That's restitution, restoring things back, putting back things into place um, to, where, to where they should be. But that's, so that's in Acts chapter 3. 
Now, I believe, personally, I believe the church began Acts chapter number 2. Acts 2 is uh, the start of the church because that's where the body of Christ begins, is in Acts chapter 2. But what you get from Acts chapter 2 all the way through Acts chapter 7 is a bunch of preaching about this type of stuff. Hmm. Times. Yeah. Uh, what does he say? Uh, repent, you know, be converted, all that kind of stuff. So there's another R word, R -E. repent and be converted that your sins be blotted out. And that sounds real good for the church, but that's not, he's not talking to a bunch of church age Christians. No. He's talking to the nation of Israel. Amen. Because what comes with the times and the seasons and the restitution and the refreshing is the nation of Israel repenting and the Lord forgiving them and covering them and restoring them back to their rightful place on the earth in Jerusalem. But he has to blot out their sins. He has to cover their sins and give them a new covenant. So what you're getting from about Acts chapter 2, or Acts chapter 1 really, but well, Acts 2 is where the church begins, but uh, I'm just going to say Acts 1. From Acts 1 to, let's just go to Acts 8. From Acts 1 to Acts 8, you're primarily not dealing with the church, even though it's there, it's, it's, it's there because the body of Christ is there, but the church as we know the church today is not the main subject yet. Mm -hmm. The main subject from Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 8 is, will you at this time restore the, nation, the kingdom to the nation of Israel? Are you going to do it now? All the preaching going through Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 8 is Jewish flavor. It's about restoring the nation of Israel back to its rightful place. And so what you get is in Acts chapter 7, who's preaching? Stephen. Mm -hmm. And Stephen's preaching to a bunch of Jews, yeah. Jewish leaders, Sanhedrin, scribes, Pharisees, and he's telling them, the whole history of all the way through up until the time they crucified Christ. And they gnashed on him with their teeth and they stoned him. And then Stephen goes up into heaven and he sees the Lord standing there. And then Stephen goes off to be with the Lord. And it looks like right about that time in Acts chapter 7, with the stoning of Stephen, in Acts chapter 8, and then the rest of the time in the book of Acts, you're going to have Paul getting saved, the first Gentile getting saved, the first Ethiopian eunuch is saved in 8, uh, Paul gets saved in 9, the first Italian man gets saved, Gentile gets saved in Acts chapter number 10, and you are kicking off right into a Gentile church age all the way through. But for the first seven <laughs> chapters of Acts, you're dealing with Israel. That's still the main subject through the first seven chapters. The church is there, but it's a mystery form. Who was, who was the mystery of the church given to? Paul. Paul. And again, Paul don't get saved until Acts chapter 9. And then he goes off into Arabia for three years, and the Lord delivers him to there all the truth concerning the church age, and then Paul goes and begins to preach and proselytize. So really what you have is we are early Acts, and that church begins in the early book of Acts. But the message is still concerning the nation of Israel's times and seasons. Some have speculated that what would have happened if they had received Stephen's preaching? Well, I don't think it would have been the nation of Israel. I think it would have been a church age rapture because the church was there in mystery form. If there would have been a pre-trib rapture, there would have been a church age body of Christ rapture with Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And then you would have had seven years of tribulation on the earth. And then you would have had a second half of millennial kingdom. You probably don't even get to Paul. Really. Yeah. Or he shows up like Moses and Elijah would have showed up to preach the tribulational message rather than Moses and Elijah preaching it. <laughs> but as soon as, as soon as they stoned Stephen, the Lord's like, I'm going primarily now to the Gentiles. Yeah. And now from... Acts 8, we have the Ethiopian. Acts 9, Paul gets saved. Acts 10, Cornelius, the, of the Italian band, Gentile, he gets saved. And then chapter 11, the, they were called Christians first at Antioch in chapter 11. Israel is on the back burner.
for the next 2,000 years, and now the church is the light of the world. So when you're reading the book of Acts, you're like, it's hard to read the book of Acts because there's healings and there's signs and there's wonders and mm -hmm. there's things going on. Yeah, because it's still you're still primarily in those early chapters dealing with Israel, and in the latter chapters, God's trying to show Israel, I've opened the door to the Gentiles. Okay? So that's your, that's your times and seasons that Paul says you have no need that I write up to you about. It. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Now, here's what happens with all your post trip. Oh, Brother Gary, you had a question. Yeah, so could question. Could you then technically call the Gospels and up to Acts chapter 2 a transition that's literally called a transition period from Old Testament to New? Yeah, and I'd say all the way up until... Up to the flood. Yeah, I'd say all the way up until, you know, Acts 8, 9, you can call it that. Really, until Paul starts preaching. Right. You know, until Paul starts delivering church age doctrine. So the church is there in Acts, early Acts, but the age of the church, the doctrine. So we call when we think of the church age, we're thinking of just the beginning of the church. Right. Church age really means the age of the doctrine of the dispensation to the church. Well, that doesn't come until Paul. So our church age doesn't really begin until Acts 9, even though the church was there in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. That's why I asked that question. I yep. always kind of thought of it that way because so many people take the Gospels, which right. was, it was given to Israel Correct. for the most part because of baptism, you know, like yep. the Church of Christ and right. the water dogs. Right. They look at the Gospels right. and hang on that. Acts 2.38. So the Church of Christ, and ask Brother Jim and Liz, the Church of Christ goes to Acts 2.38 for salvation. Repent, yep. be baptized for the remission of sins yep. and all that stuff. And you're not. You're not. You're not even. You're not even into church age doctrine. There, no. you're still dealing with the nation of Israel, who's looking for their times and seasons. Mm -hmm. Right. They're looking for a cleansing, a, a ethnic uh, a, a washing of their body, like John was doing when he was baptizing in the River Jordan. That's what they're looking for there, because they understood that there was a water purification process that accompanies, goes before the new covenant with Israel. So Peter's preaching of a baptism in Acts 2.38 is an extension of John's preaching of baptism in the book of Mark and, and Luke and Matthew there. Yep. If you want to be technical about it, there is no... Now just hold on a second, because we can spiritualize any book in the Bible. <laughs> but doctrinally, there is no doctrine technically to the church in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Right. It doesn't mean that you can't find... Doctrinal truths for the church, but Matthew, Mark, <laughs> and John were not written for doctrine to the church. It was doctrine written to the nation of Israel. Even John 3.16, which we all love and quote, that is was given for the nation of Israel to receive their Messiah. Yep. Even the even he must be born again. Again, that was meant for the nation of Israel and their new covenant. We just get in on the preaching and the teaching of it because it does fall within Pauline doctrine. But Paul didn't write that. John did. Right. Yep. Even if John got that truth from Paul, when Nicodemus was preaching, or Nicodemus was uh, go, talking there with Jesus Christ, Paul wasn't on the scene. Yeah. So all the communication between John, uh, Jesus and Nicodemus was not church-age doctrine. It's just we can make it apply to church-age doctrine based on what we know about the new birth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Romans 11. So... Here's where you. Here's what you get when you go post trib, pre wrath, or post trib, or mid trib, and you think the church goes into any portion of Daniel's seventieth week. Here's what. Here's here's some of the false doctrines you will you will fall into. Unquestionable. Number one, Calvinism. Yeah. Yeah. If you believe in post trib, sorry, brother Jim. Oh, it's okay. I'm teasing. <laughs> It's only for YouTube, so don't do it for us. If you believe in post-trib pre-wrath, and when I say post-trib pre-wrath, I mean what they mean is that five years and two and uh, five point two five years. That's where they believe the church gets raptured out. We believe we go out here. We're pre-trib. You will fall into Calvinism. Why? 
because of the last letter in, in TULIP for Calvinism yep. is the perseverance yes. of the saints. Yes. If you're one of the elect, you will persevere. That's what they believe. Mm -hmm. If you are one of the elect, you will persevere. Well, Matthew says, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So if you believe your rapture is in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, where the eagles are flying in heaven and that's your rapture, if you believe that's you there, then that means you had to endure the first 5.25 years of the first seal, the second seal, the third seal, the fourth, fifth, the fourth seal, the fifth seal, and they don't believe the second seal, the sixth seal, the second advent. They believe the sixth seal is the rapture of the church. Then they believe all seven trumpets happen uh, after the church is raptured. So you would have to believe that you are going to be one of the elect, because only the elect shall are spared. Only the elect are saved. So what they're going to teach you and what you will have to become if you believe that you have to endure that period of time there, you got to believe, well, I have to be one of the elect. Because yeah. only the elect endure to the end. If I'm one of the elect, I will endure. And if you didn't endure, then you're just not one of the elect. See where that comes in? Mm -hmm. That's Calvinism. Uh, you will fall into replacement theology. Yeah. Replacement theology. What is replacement theology? It's the belief that the church has replaced Israel. Yeah. And that's what I just showed you. You are a holy nation. So they'll say, oh, see, we are the holy nation. Israel's no longer. They don't believe that at the end of Daniel's 70th week that God comes to restore the nation of Israel at that time. They don't believe that. They believe that God jumped and threw away the nation of Israel when they rejected him as their Messiah. And now... The church is here in Israel's place and will get all the blessings that did belong to Israel. That is Church of Christ. That is Roman Catholicism. That is Mormonism. That is Jehovah's Witnesses. That is uh, Pentecostalism. All of that stuff falls in here. And none of them know their doctrine from their oatmeal. They just don't know it. Amen. And so you could talk to an, uh, a, a, a Pentecostal, a Charismatic, Church of Christ, and they will, they don't believe the, a preacher of rapture. Presbyterians do not believe in a preacher of rapture. They believe in an endurance rapture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They believe you've got to endure 5.25 or the whole seven years, and then you get raptured out. Because they recognize that the Daniel 70th week is for the nation of Israel. If you are the church replacing Israel, somebody has to go through yeah. the 70th week of Daniel. Yeah. And if you've already gotten rid of the whole nation of Israel, then you have to replace Israel with the church to go through it. So that's why they believe they go through wow. the seven years of the, of the tribulation. Hmm. Replace with theology. Uh, here's another one you have to fall, you'll fall into. Preterism. Either partial or full blown. What is preterism? Preterism means that everything in that Bible has already been fulfilled. There's no future prophecies. That is that everything you read in Revelation, Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, preterism, full blown preterism says all those things have already been fulfilled. Huh? Well, they spiritualize the text. Yeah. So where the eagles are flying around, that's not literal eagles. That's the church body of Christ rapture. Yes, ma'am? When they said the, the 144,000 God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it completely worked out, sister. Yeah. Uh, Next week. Well, the 144,000 have to get have to have their, their have sealed their foreheads yeah. before, uh, before some of the plagues start falling on the earth. And so the 144,000 are going to come in. This is our rapture here. 144,000 are going to be, if this is the first seal, uh, between the first seal and the third seal is where the 144,000 come in. Okay. So they're either here, the moment we leave, they're here on earth already, yeah. or if they're in heaven with God, having already been uh, martyred for some other reason, there's theories about that. That they would come down to earth and, and, and live again like Moses and Elijah will live again. 
and they will have to endure to the end because that really is who the elect are in that scenario. The 144,000, they are the elect. Uh, so they will be here either for the duration of all seven years, they will be here for the duration of a big point place where there could be a big trip rapture, which is Matthew 25, that falls in with line with the wise virgins. <coughs> so the 144,000 are a little obscure. What you find is that the 144,000 in Revelation 14 are standing, it looks like, in heaven before the throne on Mount Zion. And unless you make Revelation 14 here on the earth, and I have a really good friend, he's not a pastor, but he's a really good friend, and he's a Bible believer, and he knows this stuff inside and out. He makes the 144,000 on earth all seven years, and he and I are going back and forth, and I see his point, and he sees mine, we're just not 100% sure if they're here for all seven years, or only for three and a half years, uh, or if when Moses and Elijah go up, maybe they go up as well. Okay? But preterism... Preterism says that all of Revelation has already been fulfilled. All of the future prophecies have already been fulfilled. And that's convenient because when you get to places you don't understand, you just spiritualize it. Mm -hmm. So locusts coming out of the pit or, you know, uh, wormwood falling out of the sky or the eagles flying in the air. You just spiritualize it and say that's not literal, that's spiritual. It all happens in the age of the church now and all that kind of stuff. So... These are some of the things that you will fall into if you don't make a rapture take place before the tribulation. Did you have your hand up? No, I was just stretching the hand. So look at Romans 11. And we'll, we'll have to close it with this. I have something else, but we'll save it for next week. Look at Romans 11 and verse 25. It is for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. And then it says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so the fullness of the Gentiles being come in is when God is ready to remove the kingdoms of this world, remove them from belonging to this world and the Gentiles of this world, taking those kingdoms away, and giving them over to Jesus Christ. We'll look at that in just a second. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's where in Acts chapter 3 it says, Repent, be converted, that the Lord might blot out your sins and the time of refreshing may come in. That's what this is talking about here. He said there's going to come a, Zion, a, a deliverer out of Zion. He's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's not the church. Mm. Ungodliness has already been turned away from the church. Yeah. We've already been washed clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins are already forgiven. It's all under the blood for the body of Christ. I don't have to endure to the end. And then my deliverer is going to come out of heaven and come down and blot out my sins. I My sins are already blotted out. Amen. Yeah. But there's somebody's sins who do need to be blotted out, and that's the nation of Israel's sins. And then he says, For this is my covenant, look at, unto them, when I shall take away whose sins? Their sins. Well, the only person you have, the only context you have of whose sins it would be, and so all Israel shall be saved. Yeah. So here's, so what's going to happen is, get rid of that heresy. <laughs> So what you're going to get is at the second advent, after the nation of Israel has been put through seven years of hell on earth, at the second advent, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and again, that's going to be the sixth seal, Revelation 6, the seventh trumpet, Revelation 11, and the seventh vial. That's Revelation 15 and 16. The sixth seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial are all the same event. Second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns, that is when God is going to give the nation of Israel their covenant. And that's when God is going to give the nation of Israel their blotting out of their sins. And that's when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give the nation of Israel their refreshing and their restitution and their opportunity to repent. And believe me, as the, as the time ticks down to zero, because it's going from 
70 weeks down, or you know, it's going to be counting down essentially because we know it has to be fulfilled. So you have three and a half, three and a half. It's a countdown when the clock strikes zero. As the clock begins to strike zero, the nation of Israel is repenting. They're hiding in the dens and in the rocks and in the caves and in their ho and in houses and wherever they can find shelter. They're hiding and they are repenting that they ever rejected their Messiah. And now, like Peter, in the midst of their storm, while all the world is hanging out in the boat, having a pity party, <laughs> Peter, representing the nation of Israel, is crying out, oh, Lord, if that's you, <laughs> come on in, Lord. The Lord's like, oh, you come up to meet me. And they meet together, and the Lord takes them through a, a journey into the promised land, just as it was in the days of Joshua. Okay? So, you have to believe, based on Paul's writings, you have to believe that God is not through the nation of Israel. Yeah. The times and the seasons that Paul had no need to write to the church about is because the times and the seasons have to do with the nation of Israel getting their kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul was not writing to the nation of Israel in Thessalonians 4 and 5. No. Paul was writing to the church. Right. And so when Paul was writing to the church, he wrote about our rapture in Thessalonians 4. Yeah. And he says, hey church, don't worry about times and seasons about when Israel is going to be restored. You're getting out seven years prior to their restoration. And you know perfectly well the thief is coming as a, as a thief of the night. And God's not, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if those clouds want to believe they're going to be here for any poor duration of it, let them. Yeah.